Hi, what's up? I'm Channel Pup, the mascot for the level-headed fanboy. I'm gonna be going away for a few days. I'm going on a little vacation. And the thing is, there's a lot of YouTubers who will lose their YouTube career because they did something terrible behind the scenes. YouTubers like me, and I know there's a lot of you out there, we will lose our YouTube careers if we just don't upload for a few days. That is what the algorithm is like. So rather than packing like a responsible person, I am instead, right now, making a quick and dirty video. Something that is going to be completely off the cuff, but you know what? I think this could be kind of valuable because I'm going to be talking about my favorite comic book movies, just completely unscripted. And I think in doing this, it might end up contextualizing some of my other videos because then you'll have more of an idea of what my kind of standards are, what I value in movies over other things. But also, it's just a chance for me to gush for a bit. So if you don't mind, I think I'm gonna just have a ramble today. Now, of course, if you haven't done so already, I'm really close to hitting the big 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. It is insane to me that we've gotten this far, but I wanna try and make it over that finish line. So if you haven't done so already, please help me get the shiny plaque. And as always, if you are already subscribed and want to find other ways to support me, the link to my Patreon page is in the description below. There you can get updates on fan film projects that I'm working on. There's also a link to my Ko-Fi page as well for one-off donations. YouTube ad revenue is not a brilliantly consistent form of income. There's a lot of factors that are out of my control. So your support does help ends me. It is hugely appreciated. And I do try my best to make sure that you are rewarded for your support. All right, chilling over, video. So I'm going to start with kind of the obvious ones, ones I've kind of talked about before, but I'm just going to quickly kind of go over them and why they do resonate with me on a very personal level beyond just kind of the, the more analytical stuff I might have covered in videos. I'm going to start off with the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy, and obviously no comic book movie is ever quite going to be able to be as influential to me as the films in the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy. I think Spider-Man 2 was the very first superhero movie I would see in the cinema, and it absolutely blew me away at the time, and it still blows me away today. I think I love it more as an adult than I did as a kid. Even when I was a kid, I was declaring it the best movie ever, so if I'm, if I'm loving it more now than I did back then, uh, yeah, it's gonna speak to how much I adore those movies. And yeah, I, I adore all of them. I, I consider all of these to be like 10 out of 10s. And I know people are going to say, Pup, how can you consider it a 10 out of 10 if like it does have flaws that you do admit to, such as, you know, MJ ditching John Jameson at the altar at the end of Spider-Man 2, some of the stuff in Spider-Man 3 being a little choppy. And the answer to that is I do not conflate flawlessness and perfection. Like, sometimes the flaws are things that I also like about the movie. Like, if we didn't have that moment with MJ and uh, John Jameson at the altar, we wouldn't get the triumphant ending that we got for Spider-Man 2. We wouldn't get that catharsis for Peter Parker. If Spider-Man 3 were not a little bit choppy in its first act, we would not have gotten all the great stuff that's in that movie, all those great character arcs. Obviously, those movies have a very larger-than-life feel to them, but I think emotionally, they are some of the most grounded comic book movies I've seen. Peter, Harry, and MJ are all very flawed people, but they are people that you do want to root for. Peter's problem being immaturity, MJ's problem being indecision, and Harry's problem being obsession. And we see how these kind of flaws, these uh, negative sides to these characters, all kind of tear away at each other's lives. But beneath all that, there's this kinship that comes to the forefront at the very end of Spider-Man 3. And it is one of those things where when I was a kid, the things I loved the most about these movies were like the train fight or the bank side building fight in Spider-Man 2. And, and yes, those action sequences are still a major part of these movies for me. These are still part of why I adore these movies. Sam Raimi's direction, how he masters seamlessly weaving his way in and out of different genres, from drama to slapstick comedy to horror. These are movies that stylistically are just constantly refreshing themselves in a way that doesn't ever actually break the tone of these movies. At least not for me anyways. I don't think they're corny. I don't think they're cheesy. I think they're very uplifting. But I think there is such a mastery of character on display in these movies, the relationships between these characters. What sticks with me now is scenes like uh, when Peter confesses to Aunt May in Spider-Man 2 that he was responsible for Uncle Ben's death. 
and she withdraws her hand and she she leaves and goes upstairs to her room and the shot just holds there on Peter alone at the table. That is, like, uncompromising. I've always described that scene as uncompromising, but I cannot think of a better word for it. And, of course, Aunt May's pep talk with Peter later in the film before he becomes Spider-Man again. And that line about how we have to go steady and give up the thing we want the most, even our dreams, is like, that's so haunting, so mature. It's like, the, the change from, like, the dialogue style from Spider-Man 1 to 2 is insane. I still adore Spider-Man 1, though. And again, these movies have no shortage of fun, either. Like, you will not find a more watchable comic book movie villain than Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin. While on the subject of the absolute best comic book movies of all time, I've also got to talk about the Spider-Verse movies, the two that we have so far. We also recently got the short film The Spider Within at last, after like, not knowing what was going on with that short film for ages. I was thinking I might do a video on it, but decided against it for now anyway, because I just don't have much to say about it, and I don't know if anyone's actually curious as to what I think of it. I think it's good. Into the Spider-Verse just exploded onto the scene, surprising everybody. I, I think this is the closest we've ever come to matching kind of the cultural importance of the original Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy. Because these movies just came at the concept of Spider-Man from a completely different angle. This is not like one man. Spider-Man is anybody and everybody. There can be a sense of family to Spider-Man beyond just life as the alter ego. And they've given us some very unique adaptations to classic Spidey stories, with the first movie obviously being the Spider-Man origin story, but adapted through this big multiversal lens. And it is, of course, the origin of Miles Morales as well, the ultimate Spider-Man. Or, well, he was the ultimate Spider-Man for a time. It's Peter again now, but it's a different Peter. Comic books, they reboot a lot. Obviously, these movies are not quite as grounded as the Raimi trilogy, and that works in their favor. I think that's the thing, is you kind of got to do the opposite now. You know, if you, if you want to kind of recapture that magic, you got to go in a different direction, and that's exactly what these movies do. But they still feel big. There's still a sense of scope to them, and there, there's still an absolute artistry to the way that these films are made. For starters, I mean, they're animated. And every single frame of these movies is so meticulously designed. And they really use the animation to their advantage as well. From just how expressive these characters are. Even adding more onto that with like the sort of the comic booky kind of splash text that appears from time to time to accentuate certain moments. But it's able to take that sort of larger than life imagery that you would associate with Spider-Man to its extreme. I think Across the Spider-Verse is even better in my opinion. It's so clever what that film is doing with Spider-Man. The Spidey Society is effectively telling Miles, like, this is how the Spider-Man story has to go. You are Spider-Man. This is how your story is going to go. There are certain tropes that occur in every Spider-Man story. Canon events. And Miles is effectively saying, no, I want complete and total agency over my own story. These tropes will not pull me down. It's effectively Spider-Man versus the Spider-Man story. And just the imagery of Miles being chased down by all these different Spider-Men, and these are all different designs from Spidey's history. It's like the dude is literally being chased by lore. It is so clever, but it does it without being too wink wink nudge nudge isn't this meta. But beyond that, I also just loved all the day-to-day -day stuff back in Miles' dimension where he's like fighting against the spot, he needs to attend the meeting with his teacher. And again, it's done with all the artistry of the first Into the Spider-Verse movie, cranked up a few notches as well as they really get experimental with the animation in that second film. So, okay, all those are my favorite Spider-Man movies. I, I think these are the best ones. At the same time, I, I have to at least mention the other Spider-Man films because there is some brilliant stuff going on there too. I commend the hell out of The Amazing Spider-Man 1 for being as kind of sincere and against the grain of the MCU, which was the big thing at the time. It was a film that was working overtime to kind of rationalize the character of Peter Parker and all those fantastical elements into something that could actually feel real. A and that is impressive. Some might call that tryhard, but it's very impressive. The way this film would connect all the dots, connect some dots that don't even need to be connected, to be honest. But it's like, you know, Peter Parker isn't just a loner because he's a geek stereotype and he's friendless. No, it's, it's because he's got abandonment issues because his parents walked out on him. That's really, really smart. 
I think the film is a little less sure of itself than the Raimi trilogy. For one, the lizard was not an ideal villain for this film. I did enjoy the lizard a lot, though, but he feels like a remnant left over from the Raimi era when this film has, up until that point, tried to move in its own direction, one that's a bit more serious, one that's a bit more generally grounded, and yeah, lizard just was not the ideal villain for this film. But I did enjoy him. Amazing Spider-Man 2 is obviously not really going to be in the conversation for best comic book movies of all time, but I do appreciate that it's a film where everyone is working against their own personal clocks and like time running out is the big through line of that film. I think that's a really smart idea and I like the idea of that being kind of the force working against all these characters in kind of like a Love Actually style of narrative that focuses on different characters. Obviously execution is important and I don't think the Amazing Spider-Man 2 really landed that, but at the same time, I admire what they were going for. The MCU movies, I think, are great. Homecoming, I think, is a very tight little package. It's just a nice injection of pure Spidey fun. But it's also moving in a much lighter direction than the previous films did. Far From Home, I do not get the hate. I think it's a great movie. Is it as good as the best Spider-Man films, like the Raimi trilogy or the Spider-Verse movies? No, no, I, I wouldn't put it that far but I think it's a great film. Spidey's been through a lot with like the Avengers disappearing and the death of Iron Man. And it's now not just like he can choose to just, you know, be a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. He has to be the world's protector at this point. And Mysterio taking advantage of that. It's, it's really great stuff. And it's got some incredible action beats as well. Like, especially like that London bridge scene, which just showcases Spidey's ingenuity and his ability to improvise. Just spectacular. Then No Way Home is a really interesting one. I'm gonna say this, the story is, like, holier than a Swiss cheese. And I don't think it makes the most of Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield returning, which in some ways is a good thing because this is Tom Holland's third movie and it doesn't compromise on that. It, it, it doesn't, like, take a moment to be like, hey, look, here's Tobey and Andrew. No, they are supporting characters in his story. And I think that was right for this movie. But I also love how, like, the villains play a major role in this as well. But also how sobering it is, not only to Tom Holland's Spider-Man, but also just the tone of these movies once Aunt May dies. It becomes a lot heavier. The whole cinematography of the film changes its style. It does look like a lot of it was shot over a Zoom call. I, I do kind of agree. I think there are some shots in there that look fantastic. But there is very much a pandemic -y kind of feel to this film. And you know what? I like it. I, I, I like that about this film. It's a time delineator. It's a period piece in a way. Spider-Man 1 back in 2002 was like the ultimate sort of post 9-11 uplift movie. And it did have a very uplifting effect on America and New York at the time, which it needed to have. And I think No Way Home does the same for the post COVID-19 era. It was exactly the film we all needed to get us out of our homes, get us with our friends and loved ones again as we sat down to see old friends on the big screen. And we cheered, we applauded, and the film looks a little bit strange at times because it was made during the pandemic. But it's like I watched this film again and I'm just like, yeah, that was that era. There was a big historical event going on in the world at that time. And this was just the film we needed. I do not think by any stretch that No Way Home is one of the most well-made comic book movies of all time, but I, I do think it's one of the most important comic book movies of all time. Because of the kind of movie that it was and the time that it came out, it was just the perfect film for the post-COVID era. All right, I've talked about Spider-Man. If you, if you want more in-depth analyses of those movies, it just so happens I've done a lot of that on this channel, so you can check that out. In fact, I think you should. There's like 10 hours of it, roundabout. Next up, it, it, this is going to be controversial, but I, I'm not shying away from it. So the Zack Snyder DC trilogy are up there as my favorite comic book movies of all time as well. And I know there's a lot of people that really hate these movies, but I'm not going to shy away from showing my love for them. I think the thing with the Snyder DC films is they are very out there. These are very unique depictions of some of these characters. To be honest, I think the only one of these that really doesn't feel archetypal to the comics is Batman. In that we do begin the story with him killing folks and getting ready to kill Superman. These are like our first impressions of that Batman. And it's not just that he's in a dark place, it's that he has actually killed some folks. It starts off with an incredibly subversive deconstruction of Batman. And I think it's very much up for debate as to whether or not they went too far. Personally, I, I do think it goes a little too far. But I won't deny it's a really cool story. 
As for everything else, it's all about as you would expect. I, I get there's the complaints that Superman doesn't seem optimistic enough. Optimism isn't actually a pillar of Superman, though. Superman is an idealist first and foremost, and I, I think the thing with these movies is they do present us with a world that does kind of mirror our own. Even if it has a lot of fantastical elements to it, it is a world that kind of politically speaking matches our own. And if you take an idealist and put them into that world, they're going to reflect in some interesting ways. They're not always going to be happy smiles and everything will get better. Superman is kind of a stranger to this world. And in the real world, there is very much a fear of power, with businessmen constantly wrestling for power. That's kind of what Lex Luthor is. I want to take this all-powerful being and prove that I am more powerful than the all-powerful. There's also the parallels to immigration and terrorism. Superman is an immigrant to our world, General Zod is a terrorist to our world. And the media and a lot of radicalized people who are afraid of the terrorists are now struggling to kind of see the difference between the immigrant and the terrorist. I think that's a really clever story. And then by the end, the immigrant dies for his world in battle protecting it? Showing that Superman truly is human, even if he's from Krypton. That to me is as Superman as it gets. I don't need him to be all hunky-dory smiles rescuing cats out of trees, I, I like that stuff plenty. Superman 1978 is an excellent movie, don't get it twisted. But I think the story of Superman as an immigrant that was willing to die for a world that rejected him because they couldn't see the difference between him and General Zod is just an excellent story and a really important and inspired lens to view that story through. And of course, Zack Snyder's Justice League, which is just an absolute triumph as we see the impact left by Superman. How now that he's gone, enemies are coming to prey on the world and that comes in the form of Darkseid and Steppenwolf. We've got our enlightened Batman, inspired by Superman's sacrifice. He's no longer a killer, but a sentinel for life. Where in the previous film, he sought to kill Superman. In this film, he's determined to bring him back. Batman is one of my favorite things about this film. I love seeing an enlightened Batman, one that's more of a clear-cut hero. It's that kinder side to Batman that I, I don't think we always get to see. Him inspiring faith in the rest of the Justice League. It's, it's just wonderful stuff. And look, I have to mention the Justice League cut for a second here, but like, look, in Justice League, like, the characters were all at each other's throats, it was about the conflict between the Justice League, whereas in this one, they're all really respectful of each other. They are all very skilled people who are in this for their own reasons, and they support one another, and that is such a refreshing and less cynical change of pace. There's such a sincerity that is consistent across all of the Snyderverse DC trilogy. There are obviously logical laps. There are parts where the stories don't logistically make much sense, but thematically these things land. Not to mention they are a feast for the senses as well. Incredible soundtracks by Hans Zimmer and Junkie XL. The cinematography across the board is just immaculate. And Zack Snyder really knows how to direct a great action sequence. When I think my favorite comic book movie trilogies, I think the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy and the Zack Snyder Justice League trilogy. And I think they both kind of typify what I love so much about their respective universes between Marvel and DC. I want to talk about my favorite Batman movies for a sec. I'm going to start off by talking about The Batman, which is obviously the most recent one with Robert Pattinson in it. Now, I've honestly loved all of the live action Batman movies. Yes, even Batman and Robin, but I don't think a Batman movie has ever encompassed as much of Batman as I've wanted it to. Different Batmen have kind of focused on different elements of the character. With, you know, Keaton's Batman, it was very much about the theatrics. With Kilmer's Batman, it was very much that tortured psyche. Bale's Batman was all about being like a symbol of hope for Gotham. And Batfleck, we, we came so close because we do see him do a lot of detective stuff in Batman v Superman, but it is also just the fact that he has killed people, he has crossed that Rubicon, that it makes it difficult for me to kind of see him as like the definitive Batman. Also got to show my love for Adam West's Batman as well, of course. With Pattinson's Batman in The Batman, I feel like we got a comprehensive Batman in a comprehensive Batman movie. We've got that world's greatest detective here, and what better enemy for the world's greatest detective to go up against than the Riddler. 
And of course, I got to talk about the cast. Yes, I think Robert Pattinson and Paul Dano are incredible in their roles as Batman and the Riddler, respectively. I adore this take on the Riddler and how he kind of shows us the truth about Gotham City and uses the Batman as kind of his ally in a very twisted sense. How he uses him to bring Falcone to the light. Also, yeah, the noir detective tone of this film is fantastic. It's a match made in heaven. Batman and that sort of noir detective feel. Yeah, perfect. But there's also no shortage of really cool stuff of like Batman beating up people as well, which is what you want to see. The scene where Batman is fighting against the Riddler's goons in the rafters might even top the warehouse scene from Batman v Superman for me, even though I do feel like that scene is the scene that rewrote the playbook for how a Batman fight scene should play out. And then, yeah, this film just has some incredible artistry to it as well. The cinematography by Greg Frazier is just top tier. This film is gorgeous. And the music by Michael Giacchino is fantastic. I also just love some of the unique creative flourishes taken with Batman himself as well, how he slowly walks his way through the room, methodically taking in his surroundings and stuff. That's not something we've really necessarily seen before. He doesn't go charging in like a bull. He takes his time. He's calm and in control of the situation. We also got the fun of seeing a less refined Batman as well, one that doesn't quite know how to glide yet. Also the ending scene with him and Catwoman on their motorcycles as they part ways and they sort of almost like dance their way through Gotham. What an incredible ending. The Batman is an immaculate film. It's easily my favorite live action Batman film, but uh, for one more Batman film that definitely makes my list of favorite superhero movies, it would be Batman Mask of the Phantasm. Gotta represent the animated Batman. It goes without saying everything that makes Batman the animated series incredible is here. Eric Radomski's direction, Paul Dini's writing, Bruce Timm's artwork, combined with the definitive Batman performance from the late great Kevin Conroy, Mark Hamill as the Joker, and an incredible score by the late Shirley Walker. Everything comes together here to make something perfect, which is what we had in Batman the Animated Series, yet here we've got something that is a much more introspective character study on Bruce Wayne and Batman kind of serving as a very unique origin story, as Batman is deciphering a case, the case of the Phantasm, which ties very far back to his earliest days, back when Bruce was young and fell in love with a woman called Andrea Beaumont. This film has such an honest portrayal of the sort of the trauma that comes after grieving the loss of a parent, how you almost kind of feel guilty for being happy. And there's a real focus on the humanity that is lost with being Batman. It's a truly tragic story. One that makes you question, is being Batman Bruce overcoming his trauma or being consumed by it? Also, what this film managed to do with both, I, I think it was a PG rating and a under two hour runtime, the storytelling prowess on display here is nothing short of breathtaking. I know a lot of folks are gonna be wondering, where's the Dark Knight? And I understand that it is a contender for like the best movies of all time for a lot of people. And I will agree it is an incredibly well-made piece. I, I do love The Dark Knight, but uh, it it's not my favorite as far as Batman stuff goes. I, I do still prefer a, a more comprehensive version of Batman himself. The Dark Knight is an excellent movie with a very impressionistic relationship to Christopher Nolan's direction. And on its own two feet, yes, it is absolutely stunning. Damn near perfection. I just like the Batman better. All right, so yeah, we've talked about Spider-Man, we've talked about Superman, we've talked about Batman. Growing up, the Iron Man movies were incredibly important to me. I remember back in 2008 seeing Iron Man 1 for the first time, and it is kind of like that sort of evolution of the sort of Sam Raimi Spider-Man with a bit of a touch of influence from 2005's Batman Begins. So you've got the kind of the uplifting, family-friendly fantasy that is Spider-Man, but with a bit more of an emphasis on the sort of logistic realism that came with Nolan's Batman Begins. Iron Man 1 is kind of like the love child of those two, and it is very much what informs the rest of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the fact that this film's production was as troubled as it was, and it managed to come out as it did and lead to what it did, is a testament to the talent and the tenacity of all of the filmmakers involved. There was a lot working against this film, but it came out the way that it did, and it led to probably one of the most lucrative film franchises of all time. 
one that is still going on to this day, almost 20 years later. I love the Iron Man movies, they will always mean a lot to me. I remember, I think it was, oof, maybe like my 15th or 14th birthday, going to see Iron Man 2 in the cinema, and just having a whale of a time with that film. I understand that Iron Man 2 is a little choppier than a lot of people would probably like it to be. I, I do think it is the choppier of the Iron Man films, but it's still a super enjoyable film. I, I do love Iron Man 2 a lot. We've got quite a loose adaptation of the Devil in the Bottle storyline. We've got Rhodey becoming War Machine. And we gotta talk about the Monaco fight scene where we first see Whiplash and Iron Man puts on his suitcase armor and it's like the coolest thing I've ever seen. And dude, like, Marvel movies, MCU movies shot on film stocks just hit differently. Iron Man 1 and 2 are two of the best looking MCU films. They look glorious. This was Marvel Studios when they really had a lot to prove. I, I even saw like a little behind the scenes thing where like Robert Downey Jr. was talking about how he hated wearing the Iron Man helmet, but it was because back then they were so hesitant to spend budget on CGI. It's like, my God, so much has changed and it looked amazing back then. Iron Man 1 and 2 still look good today. Iron Man 3, I believe, falls into the post-digital era of the MCU. Like, I think after the first Avengers movie, they started filming these things on digital. However, with Iron Man 3, they're not quite leaning into that digital look in the same way that they did in the first Avengers movie or a lot of the subsequent MCU movies. Iron Man 3 is a bit more intimately shot is what I've noticed. The camera angles are a bit tighter on the subject for the most part. There's a lot more sort of close-up shots. There's a lot more sort of focus on the faces and the facial expressions, which makes a lot of sense as, you know, a big part of this story is Iron Man having anxiety attacks after the events of the first Avengers movie. Carrying a nuke into space and blowing up an alien race will do that to you. And we really go ham in this movie with how much Iron Man likes to tinker and experiment as a way of kind of taking his mind off of his fears. As for the Mandarin twist, so I, I do think it is okay for the story. I think it services the story just fine. It's a cool twist. I think the frustrating thing just was that like MCU villains were becoming quite hit and miss at this time, at, at this point. And subsequently they would get quite a bit worse. And had the Mandarin been the real Mandarin, he would have been one of the best MCU villains. Partly because of that very grounded, he's a terrorist thing. Like, he's not like some superhuman or some god from another dimension, or even a tech mogul like we saw a lot of in Iron Man 1 and 2. This seemed like a really smart update to the character of the Mandarin. And I know people have mentioned like the whole whitewashing thing with Ben Kingsley playing a Chinese character, but he's not Chinese. This is something that Ben Kingsley even said on, I think it was the Jonathan Ross show, was that the Mandarin is not Chinese in this version. He's an American terrorist that is using Chinese imagery and has his own sort of distorted view of like Chinese values, which he carries with him. Yeah, this would have made for one of the coolest MCU villains, and that's really the only downside there. And no, Wenwu does not stack up in my opinion. He's cool, but he doesn't stack up to this. And I think there is a little frustration from the fact that it's like, ah, we could have had a really unique and very subversive sort of final battle sequence for a film where, let's say, like, the Mandarin is the main villain and maybe he's using, like, human soldiers and stuff. But instead, we end up with a lot of Iron Mans versus a lot of fire people, which it's still cool. I won't pretend it's not cool. It's really cool. But I think we definitely missed out on something a bit more unique. But the Barrel of Monkeys rescue scene is still awesome. What we have here is still absolutely awesome. I still consider Iron Man 3 to be one of the best MCU films. Sue me. And yes, of course, Captain America as well would make it into uh, some of my favorite combat movies of all time. Specifically, Captain America The First Avenger and Captain America Civil War. I really love that sort of pulpy style of Captain America The First Avenger, the wartime aesthetic. The kind of war propaganda of World War II with the Star Spangled Man scene. I think Red Skull was done really well. And I think they really embraced what could have been the cheesiest side of Captain America, but delivered it in a way that was sincere, but also works really well for the grounded, realistic comic book movie. Which is funny, considering we're talking about a movie about a super soldier versus a red skeleton man, but it, you know, that that's what makes this work, is the fact that they were able to actually make all this stuff work in a way that embraces all that comic booky goodness, while also being convincing enough as kind of a realistic film. A lot of people are going to hate me for it, but I... 
I get Captain America the Winter Soldier. I get that its story is kind of important, you know, the story about, like, surveillance and kind of our freedoms, and that's all very impressive. I, I think the stuff of, like, Captain America learn to live in a modern world is also really cool. Like, one of the best scenes is when he sees, like, Peggy Carter and she's an old woman. The story of Bucky's really great, but for some reason the film just doesn't click with me and I can't quite put my finger on what it is. Like, all that's there and all that's good, I just don't find myself enjoying it that much. Civil War, on the other hand, is a very impressive film. I think the tensions leading to the conflict between Iron Man, Captain America, and Bucky are all absolutely stellar, and it has one of the best final battle sequences in any MCU film. The Iron Man vs. Cap scene is absolutely incredible, but I also love how we're kind of exploring the politics of the Marvel Universe and how these characters factor into that, and the kind of rift that it creates between the two factions. It's a very character-centric film, and okay, we also got to talk about the big fan service elephant in the room. Yeah, the airport fight is just unmitigated good times, literal candy-colored fun. We've got the debut of Black Panther, we've got the debut of MCU Spider-Man. It lays out the future of the MCU, but in a way that complements the film that it's in. A way that services the whole Sokovia Accords business. But the film also deconstructs Captain America in a really interesting way, showing that his kind of idealism does also come from a place of stubbornness and naivety. That there are some situations where the unwavering self-righteousness doesn't really work. And in the end, Zemo wins. It's a really clever way of actually having a villain win. Speaking of villains winning though, we gotta talk about Avengers Infinity War, which is, yeah, a crowning achievement as far as the MCU goes. It is a masterclass in character and stakes. It's a film populated by a huge cast of all really well-developed characters that all weave their way into this story pretty much seamlessly. And it has such an unconventional structure to it. This, this is the point where the MCU isn't even trying to be grounded and realistic anymore. This is a big climactic payoff event. But it's a story where the villain wins, and I mean really, really wins. As in like, yeah, heroes die. And yeah, the cinema falling absolutely silent when all of the characters are getting turned to dust. The sheer tension when the Avengers are trying to get the Infinity Gauntlet off of Thanos' hand, and they almost get it, but then Quill breaks down. And it's so human in how he breaks down as well, so very raw. We're seeing all of these characters push to their absolute limits, and it's all because this one guy really, really, really believes that he is in the right. Just absolutely incredible storytelling. Endgame is also great, don't get me wrong, and th there's, you know, a lot of moments in Avengers Endgame that are absolutely some of the biggest, most iconic moments in superhero film history, but I don't think the film as a whole is quite as tight as Infinity War is. It has some of my favorite moments, but it isn't one of my favorites. The Guardians of the Galaxy Trilogy. Now, that first one is a really great film, but it did feel a little bit like kind of Marvel meets Disney. It's quite tropey. Like with Rocket Raccoon and Groot, I don't think they quite outgrown the sort of the Timon and Pumba kind of archetype just yet in this one. They would go on to do so in the second one, but in this one, it still felt quite simple. With Quill and Gamora, you've got Fry and Leela. With Rocket Raccoon and Groot, you've got Timon and Pumba. And with Drax, you've got Patrick Star. They do go a little deeper than that, but not quite as deep as I would like them to in the first film. Uh, I didn't think Ronan was a great villain, and I think the pacing does slow quite a bit once they're in prison, but the emphasis on the characters' relationships, how the sort of family bond is forged, that's something a lot of films have tried and failed to replicate where the first Guardians of the Galaxy really earns that. Pair that with James Gunn's irreverent dialogue and humor, and that rare, actual, good use of needle drop music, and the first Guardians of the Galaxy definitely lays down an excellent foundation for the sequels, which are, in my opinion, a lot better. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is absolutely superb. All of these characters have come along a little bit, but we're now seeing Rocket and Groot going on their own adventures with Yondu and the Ravagers, Peter Quill going off to meet his father, only to find out that his father is a genocidal planet. While the film is very, like, outlandish in terms of, like, its content and the logistics and everything, and that's all good stuff, it's a big space opera, that's what I want it to be, the sincere emotional maturity is, uh, it's brought up a notch in this one. Especially once you reach that third act and Quill is just determined to kill Ego, as his dad 
by the way, after what he did to his mother. And then, of course, there's the death of Yondu as well, and kind of how, like, Yondu is like, you know, he might have been your father, but he wasn't your daddy, and Yondu is the true father of Peter Quill, effectively, in that emotional sense, anyway. It keeps well in the theme of, like, the found family, but also, man, it is moving. And then Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is even better, as in a bid to save Rocket Raccoon, the Guardians travel to the place where Rocket Raccoon was born, under the watchful eye of the High Evolutionary, a man determined to manipulate nature into what he deems perfection, no matter how cruel it is. And the High Evolutionary is truly one of the most despicable comic book movie villains I've ever seen, and I mean smart move making his big victim animals. That is one way to get your audience to hate the main villain. The action is the best it's been in these movies. It's a tremendously confident film, and I'd probably dare say it's the best film of Phase 5 so far. Despite how heavy the film can get, it's also tremendously uplifting, particularly more towards the end. Yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy 3 is definitely one of Marvel Studios' best works. Black Panther Wakanda Forever is, in my opinion, the strongest film of Marvel Phase 4, but also another one of Marvel Studios' best works. This is a film that did not have to exist, because obviously they were in a horrible spot with the lead actor, Chadwick Boseman, and his untimely death. Chadwick Boseman was incredible as King T'Challa and absolutely irreplaceable. And it was really looking like there's no right way to kind of move the Black Panther franchise forward. And this is a film where anyone would have understood if they cancelled this one. However, what we had here was a film that didn't serve to be an entry into a greater Marvel Cinematic Universe arc. It wasn't there to set up any sequels or anything like that. What we had here was a film born out of love for the memory of Chadwick Boseman and a testament to the tenacity of the filmmakers such as the director Ryan Coogler. Boseman's presence is absolutely felt in this film. I think the first Black Panther film really benefit from having a very strong supporting cast. And they did a great job at carrying this one. I think Shuri becomes a very compelling character to take on the mantle of the Black Panther as she works to recreate the Blue Flower in order to obviously not resurrect King T'Challa, but to resurrect the legend of the Black Panther. That's really awesome stuff. I really enjoyed her dynamic with Okoye, and of course the sort of the grieving family dynamic as well with her and Queen Ramonda. Namor is a superb villain, and the underwater kingdom of Talakan was really wonderfully brought to life. I also just love the build-up to Shuri becoming the Black Panther, that sense of anticipation in the air. You've got that montage set to Alone by Birda Boy, which is an incredible song, and then the shocking cameo from Killmonger. As we see that, like it or not, vengeance is kind of a motivator for this new Black Panther, and that's something that she's got to overcome. And when she spares Namor, it's a really triumphant moment. Black Panther Wakanda Forever is a film that had an uphill battle to fight, but my god did it ever win. It is a fantastic movie. X-Men First Class is, in my opinion, the best X-Men film we've had so far. At least from Fox's X-Men universe, obviously we're yet to see how things play out with the Marvel Studios X-Men but I think personally right now, First Class is the one to be. And yeah, it is helped a lot by the fact that I'm a huge fan of Matthew Vaughn as a director. But with this film, it kind of serves as an origin story for both Magneto and Professor Charles Xavier. It's really cool to get a superhero film that takes place during some different time periods for a change. We've got the origins of Magneto back in 1944 in Poland, but with the majority of the film taking place during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And there's a real slickness to this film. And again, I think that comes from Matthew Vaughn's direction, but I think this was a real breath of fresh air for the X-Men films. I think Sebastian Shaw, played by Kevin Bacon, was a really good villain. Also, my little monkey brain liked seeing the X-Men in their yellow suits. I think X-Men Days of Future Past was a really good follow-up. I really do enjoy that film a lot, but this one is my favorite. All right, so those are my favorite comic book movies. I'm not sure if I missed one, but what are your favorite comic book movies? Comment below, discuss, and as always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, be sure to hit subscribe, hit the like button, and in the description below is the link to my patron, where for as little as a dollar a month, you can get your name in the credits of these videos. And a special shout out goes to the patrons in the $5 and above tier. We have RT0, Wilmer, Kalex, Richard Rogers, Glad Goku, Dare Denny, SSS06, Kale Bennett, That Jordo, Ken K of Warheads has balloons to inflate. I can't find any helium anywhere. Dazzle Fizzle, Super Hyper Mecha SP, Cirrus the Skeptic, Biotin, 
Oh no, I've used up all the helium. What am I meant to do now? I, I get it. There's a little continuity between you guys now. And Vera Wild. Thank you folks so much for your generosity. And to those of you at home, thank you so much for watching. And have a great day. Now get out of here.